one could look at the myths surrounding the legend of the last world emperor and see the Roman Christian destiny doctrine simply being repackaged in arcane apocalyptic symbolism. The description of the last world emperor provided in the pseudo-Methodist and the Tiburtine oracle took root and came to fruition during the Middle Ages. The legend was fleshed out in the writings of Abbot Adso around 950 AD. Adso was the abbot of Monte and Deer in France, and he was one of the foremost European writers in the 10th century. Around 950 AD, he penned the most complete treaty on the Antichrist to date. First and foremost, Adso strongly argued for a Jewish origin to the future Antichrist. It is believed he based this argument on the sermons of Pope Gregory the Great from the 6th century. Adso wrote in his letter on the Antichrist, Antichrist will be born from the Jews, namely from the tribe of Dan. The work of Adso set in motion a new religious justification for the bloody persecution of the Jews. Should the Jews be exterminated, the future Antichrist could be thwarted. Adso also fleshed out the last world emperor eschatology found in the pseudo-Methodist. He insisted that before the Antichrist could come, a Frankish king must come to power and this king would triumph over all the enemies of Christendom and rule a peaceful Christian kingdom. Adso made a significant change in the legend by shifting the ethnic identity of the last world emperor from the King of the Greeks to the King of the Franks. Some historians believe that this shift was fostered more by political concerns than a theological application. He sought to strengthen the claims of the West Frankish kings against powerful local barons and the power of German Saxony to the coveted title. Adso wrote that after the peaceful reign of the last world emperor, the king would journey to Jerusalem and ascend the mountain of olives to surrender his royal crown to God and die. The pseudo-Methodist differs from Adso and places this event at Golgotha, but both works agree that this event would signal the advent of the Antichrist. Adso made another important shift in traditional doctrine concerning the Antichrist. For centuries, the restraining force of the Antichrist referred to in 2 Thessalonians was seen as the Roman Empire that would continue until the end of time. He shifted the restraining action to the kingdom of the last world emperor, who would be of Frankish descent. The real impact of Adso's work would not be felt for another 150 years, but his rationale and apocalyptic imagery would inspire a generation to crusade to the Holy Land. In a way of speaking, as Papaeus of Hierapolis was the Hal Lindsay of the patriotic period in church history. Giacomo Fiore was the Hal Lindsay of the 12th century and the medieval church in general. Adso's eschatology struggled to stay within the official Roman Catholic orthodoxy of amillennialism, but this was not the case with Giacomo Fiore. Augustine took history out of biblical apocalypticism and replaced it with allegory, while Joachim put history back into God's divine plan. 
During the 12th century, the Roman Catholic Church was disintegrating with corruption, greed, sexual license, and power grabbing. The 200-year period, from 1073 to 1294, was the era of absolute papal authority. This era extended from Gregory VII to Boniface VIII. During these centuries, we see the papacy at the height of its power and authority. The most ruthless of the tyrannical popes was Pope Innocent III, who crowned himself as the Vicar of Christ on earth and stood all-powerful with every ruler under his authority. During these tumultuous centuries, a reform movement grew within the church calling for the church and the papacy to repent of their gross corruption and return to a true spiritual holiness birthed in humility. Giacomo Fiore was part of this reformist movement. Giacomo's theology and eschatology revolved around three central themes. He was obsessed with the correct interpretation of scripture especially in regards to the mystery of the Trinity and discovering the divine plan and purpose of God carved into human history. He clearly believed that the Trinity, etched on every page of the Bible, was also active in every age of human history. This belief led to his greatest contribution to the study of eschatology. Joachim was obsessed with the patterns of human history, and he organized these patterns into three distinct ages of overlapping history that manifested the mystery of the Trinity. Joachim taught that the first age of history belonged to God the Father, as revealed in the Old Testament, while the second age belongs to Jesus Christ that is also known as the Church Age. The third mystical age of history would belong to the Holy Spirit. These three overlapping spheres would encompass all our human history, past, present, and future. He also taught that the secrets of these three ages could be discovered in the Bible by accurate scriptural study. Joachim believed that he was living in the last days of the Second Age, the Church Age, and the moral corruption found in the Roman Catholic Church was the precursor of Antichrist. This belief eventually got him in trouble with Pope Innocent III, who rejected the reformist movement within the Church. According to Joachim and his future supporters, known as Franciscan Spirituals, the mystical Third Age of the Holy Spirit would be ushered in by the tireless work of an angelic pope who would purify the papacy and the monastic orders to create a world filled with holiness and peace. Joachim did not subscribe to the last world emperor theory vividly described by Adso. Instead, he looked for a reforming, angelic pope who would create a holier world in which people would attain unsurpassed understanding of the Bible. The Third Age of the Holy Spirit, described by Joachim and the Franciscan spirituals, is similar to the 1,000-year millennial doctrine being preached today. In a way of speaking, the angelic pope legend was the doctrine of the last world emperor being repackaged. The concept that all human history could be found in the pages of the Bible would have caused Augustine to turn over in his grave. Because Joachim's three-age theory was a serious break with the allegorical amillennialism of the Roman Catholic Church. Joachim put history back into Bible prophecy. His method of biblical interpretation linked actual historical events 
with apocalyptic symbolism. Joachim's theories quietly reintroduced the first seeds of premillennialism back into Christian eschatology. How important was Joachim's theory of the three ages of history? This theory impacted much more than Christian eschatology. It had a dramatic impact on future philosophies to arise during the coming age of reason. Men like George Hegel and Karl Marx used the writings of Joachim to envision a futuristic utopia of human cooperation void of God. The New Age movement of the latter 20th century grabbed onto Joachim's Third Age theory to formulate their concept of a future age of idyllic peace and prosperity called the Age of Aquarius. <laughs>